pleasure uh, to have you uh, uh, tune me in today. Uh, I'm Dr. Richard Allinger of the uh, Newburgh uh, Theological uh, Seminary, uh, Department of Theology, uh, Division of Church History. Now, for those of you who might not know where Newburgh is, Indiana is it's in the southern part by Evansville and there's a small suburb outside of Evansville called Newburgh and in Newburgh is where the uh, Newburgh Theological Seminary is uh, has been established there uh, and it's been there ever since uh, uh, 2000 uh, the year 2000 it's been there for about uh, well close to 20 years now and uh, as you know, January, uh, for, your, for all of your uh, viewing audience information that you might not know, that uh, January uh, is uh, uh, Glaucoma Awareness Month. And uh, uh, for those people that would be interested, because... Uh, I believe 43 million Americans are affected by uh, uh, visual impairments. 43 million. A lot of people are visually impaired, and and because January is Glaucoma Awareness Month, if you if uh, you uh, in the uh, Michigan uh, southeastern Michigan region, if you want to contact the East Michigan Eye Center with Dr. Ophthalmologist Dr. Walter and Christopher Sukrowski. It's at 701 South Ballinger Highway, uh, uh, right next to McLaren General Hospital. And uh, their phone number is area code 810-238-3603 uh, for more information concerning uh, what glaucoma is. Uh, many of you have probably didn't even know that January is uh, Glaucoma Awareness Month. And also, uh, in addition to celebrating uh, the January birthdays in, in my family, uh, we're also uh, looking down uh, to January 21st, which is Martin Luther King Jr.'s observed uh, national observance. That'll be on a uh, Monday, January 21st, and you might want to get with the Flint Public Library or the Flint College Cultural Center uh, located at the corner of Kersley and Crapo, their offices, or you can get with the Concerned Pastors for Social Action. Uh, their offices are at the corner of Welsh Boulevard and Martin Luther King Avenue uh, for more information concerning the different uh, 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 celebrations and activities they're going to have that will celebrate uh, the life and legacy of the late and great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, also, uh, uh, we're February being right around the corner, uh, we're, we cannot believe, I was just talking to the program director uh, before the sh program that we've really, in Michigan here, Southeast Michigan, have had really a, a, a mild winter. I mean, not too much snow or ice or anything to speak of already, and we're all, almost in the middle of January. And uh, uh, with that being said, in a couple more weeks, uh, on February 1st, the groundhog may see his shadow, and the winter might be a fleeting winter, coming and going real quick. And in February, you know, is uh, uh, Black History Month and also um, uh, President's Day where we remember George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And uh, what, what I want to do before I get into the content of our church history lessons uh, uh, that, that will when I get into church history, uh, just by way of introduction, I'm talking a little bit about January and February, what's ahead here immediately, but uh, this we'll be talking about, I'll be tying up conclusions on this book here, uh, Earl E. Carnes' uh, Christianity Through the Centuries, a few uh, conclusion, uh, marks, remarks of uh, conclusion to this man's book that he has written and published, 
And then I want to introduce you to uh, another uh, uh, book called The Story of Christianity, Volume 1, uh, which would be uh, the early church to the dawn of the Reformation by its author, Justo L. Gonzalez. But uh, before I get into the actual church content of this program, uh, and by the way, all of my church history programs that have been aired on Comcast Cable over the last five years have been all archived on YouTube. If you would want to just go to the YouTube homepage and put in the search box, uh, Richard Allinger, that'll bring all the archived church history programs up. And you can actually uh, uh, subscribe to my channel there too. Uh, uh, these lessons are, uh, because I'm into Christian education, these, les these programs have been aired uh, in all of Southeast Michigan and archived on YouTube for the users of the whole World Wide Web and students that would be interested in actually understanding and coming to appreciate uh, and be more aware of Christian church history. Uh, and uh, so before we get into that, though, uh, I want to because President's Day is coming up right around the corner in February, Abraham Lincoln, after he had uh, uh, got the uh, 13th Amendment or the Emancipation of Proclamation through, uh, through Congress, uh, just before he was assassinated, having liberated uh, 4 million Americans from the ugly institution of slavery, uh, just before he was assassinated, he, 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 had, he was quoted to have said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have become too proud to pray to, to, the, to the God that made us, Abraham Lincoln. Well, uh, because I am a Christian educator, I want to remind you uh, and bring to your remembrance uh, all the good benefits and blessings that the Creator has bestowed upon us, and especially by sending His Son Jesus to save us and rescue us from sin. And we should be very thankful, and we should read our Bible, and we should pray. And I will always be an influencer uh, in pointing people to the Lord Jesus. Uh, it has the answer to some of uh, the sin's predicaments, in, in our in our culture and in our creation and and our salvation and our redeemer and i will always be an influencer to encourage you to become more appreciative of what uh the church of uh that jesus has been building for over two thousand years uh, become more aware of the church that jesus has been building and become more appreciative of it also and to 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 really stir yourself up and uh, do more than just say a bedtime prayer or uh, a prayer uh, over a meal such as a grace before you eat. But he, he wishes you to uh, walk with him on a daily basis and even give him two hours of your time a day walking with him and talking with him and praying every day because he loves you like no other. And I will always be an influence in your life as your teacher on television, uh, Lessons in Church History, to encourage you in uh, a good, victorious Christian life and walk with the Lord. Uh, and then uh, also, as you know, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who we call JFK, was the first Roman Catholic uh, president ever elected of all the 45 presidents. I believe President Trump is the 45th president. President Barack Hussein Obama was the 44th. And so JFK, uh, was probably, I believe, the 35th president. Uh, LBJ was the 36th, and R Richard Nixon was the 37th. Uh, and JFK, uh, before being the first Roman Catholic president, was quite a coincidence. Me, as a teacher in church history, and have, teach on the Reformation and Dr. Martin Luther, uh, I thought it was really a coincidence, him being the first Roman Catholic president before he was assassinated, was quoted to have said these words here. A man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives forever, JFK. 
And uh, he, he spoke this memorable, these memorable words in 1963, uh, just uh, five years uh, before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968. And uh, when I, I'm going to repeat what he said. A man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives forever, JFK. And you know, because I'm a Christian a church history teacher, the word Reformation is an idea. And uh, he says that this idea will live forever, uh, you know, because it's an idea. Again, a man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives forever. And uh, I, I want you to learn uh, to appreciate what Reformation is uh, from a Christian uh, world viewpoint. That's why I always refer you back to my archive programs that I've been teaching for five years. Uh, and um, because uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr.'s uh, observed birthday and celebration of his life and legacy uh, will be this January 21st also, I want to repeat uh, uh, some memorable words of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Junior, he said, uh, uh, I believe the unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. And I cannot help but agree with uh, these words of wisdom that were spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, because I do believe that the uh, truth will stand all by itself. Jesus said, not one jot nor one tittle from my word shall pass until all be fulfilled. Uh, and that the only two eternal, everything is uh, deteriorating or perishing and crumbling except the logos or the, the word of God, which is eternal, given to us from the Father of lights above and the souls that our men and women are, have, that the souls of men and women are eternal. And everything else is crumbling and perishing. And then, uh, before we get into church history, there was uh, one other, because uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, national observance is uh, January 21st, uh, he also was quoted as saying before he was assassinated in one of his great speeches, one of the greatest orators of the 20th century, the time is always right to do what is right. Again, the time is always right to do which is right. Now, by bringing uh, the, uh, you know, in the last sessions I was speaking uh, from this book, Christianity Through the Centuries, uh, and uh, we were looking at the, uh, uh, um, in previous sessions, the problems that we see in uh, the emerging church of the 21st century in Christianity and the patterns we see. And we were looking at some of the future of the Christian church as he brings this, this writing and this publication to its end. And I, I'll have to cite a few paragraphs before I can actually close this book and this particular teaching on this particular uh, book, Christianity Through the Centuries, by Earl E. Carnes. Uh, first, he said another uh, pattern in the church's past has been uh, effecting a balance between people's emotional and intellectual makeup. The, the relationship of heart and head in the Christian life, from, from the time of the Reformation, the church has uh, periodically swung from the rational stress on orthodoxy to the uh, pietistic stress on emotion. Either extreme must be avoided. The ideal would be orthodoxy on fire, that is, intellectual learning expressed in faith and action. That is balancing the head and heart. And then under the paragraph of the relation of church and state, as we bring to a conclusion the study of this uh, wonderful work of uh, Earl Carnes' Christianity Through the Centuries, uh, he says failure to maintain uh, a proper balance between the church and the state 
has posed a perennial predicament through the ages. The state dominated the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and politicized and corrupted it from 1721 until the revolution in Russia. The Roman Catholic Church often dominated or struggled for supremacy against the secular state. The church and state need to be in a mutual helpful tension. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States uh, bans the establishment of any state religion and uh, restriction of the free exercise of religion. It was not the intent of the legislators to prevent religious and ethical principles from being decisive elements in determining state action. The trend toward religious apartheid and even restricting the right of Christians to act as citizens will give rise to an amoral society or a society without morality. And as you know, I've repeated this several times, uh, John Wesley in his writings and uh, uh, John Calvin, uh, the 16th century theologian of, uh, that worked with Martin Luther in launching the Protestant Reformation wrote that uh, when, when uh, the Lord from heaven gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, uh, he engrafted uh, morality in the, the laws that he had written the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai and with his own finger and gave, the, gave them to his prophet Moses. And uh, then uh, also uh, there is one other paragraph that has to be cited to bring this book to a conclusion. Uh, the summary of this book, and that is uh, under ecumenicy. Uh, while some may wonder whether the ecumenical movement uh, represented by the World Council of Churches will result in anything but a unity based on organizational ecclesiastical machinery, there are encouraging signs that evangelicals throughout the world are beginning to realize their essential spiritual unity in the only true ecumenical and international organism. The church has a body of Christ. This may then likely be expressed in organization as a tool to promote common interests. Any sound ecumenical movement must be built on a unity of spirit based on the authority of the Bible as God's word to us and an experience of Christ as the only savior from sin. And then the fourth paragraph uh, begins to cite uh, missions. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that over one third of the population of the world lives in closed totalitarian societies, there are still many fields open to missionary endeavor. 40 million Chinese outside mainland China attracted the attention of missionaries driven out of China in 1949. And many of these Chinese uh, are now taking an interest in reaching other people. In addition, there appears to be some relaxation of the restrictions on religion in mainland communist China. The spread of vital Christianity in Asia, Africa, Russia, and Latin America has been encouraging. The church has also been willing to adopt and uh, adopt new uh, techniques to reach the unevangelized uh, parts of the world. Shortwave radio, television, uh, technological education by extension, and films have been used in the proclamation of Christ. Modern air travel has removed the barriers of space and has freed people from the rigors of long, hard trips to reach their field of service. Medical work, education, agricultural programs, and other services have helped develop higher living standards as well has opened the way for uh, witness to Christ as Savior. Like I say, the TV signal and the satellites uh, that blanket all seven continents of the earth now can go places that humans cannot go with the message of God's love for the human race. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And then uh, Carnes concludes with his last paragraph, and he is saying this, Those who study church history and have observed the operation of the uh, transforming power of the gospel over the span of centuries in remaking the lives of men and nations see the problems only has challenges to renewed effort in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it was said that socialism can put a code on every man, but they say that the gospel of Jesus Christ can put a new man in every old man. They realize that God is both the providential sustainer of the universe and the redeemer through Christ's work on the cross. Both history and its termination are in the capable hands of Christ as the Lord of history. With serene confidence in her risen Lord, the church will meet the challenges of the present as well as she has met the challenges of the past. And that's how he concluded this exhaustive work, which is a good general history, ladies and gentlemen, of Christianity through the centuries. And now, with that being said, I would like to, in the remaining few minutes of this particular session, uh, begin to introduce you to this work here that I'm going to take off the shelf called Justo L. Gonzalez's uh, The Story of Christianity. Now, this is just volume one. Uh, and volume one is the earth, the early church to the dawn of the Reformation. And volume two is about this thick also. And it's from the Reformation up to the modern emerging church of the 21st century. Uh, and the, the author is Justo Gonzalez, and I want to introduce you to this, this great work, which is a good general history of Christianity since uh, it was established in the shed holy blood of Jesus on the cross of Golgotha, the New Testament, in his blood. Uh, and uh, uh, so what I'm going to begin to do is introduce you uh, of, the, of the early church, Justo Gonzalez cites uh, what Apostle Paul penned in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when, when, the, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, uh, born of a woman, born under the law, and ex explained the early, to the early Christians, uh, uh, be, uh, let me see, let me say, rephrase that again. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, and explained the early Christians did not believe that the time and place of the birth of baby Jesus had been left to chance. In other words, this was, uh, when, when baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem, this was not left to chance, that this was actually the, the fullness of time when according to all the prophecies that the Almighty would incarnate the flesh and live among men. And he was born to Virgin Mary as baby Jesus in Bethlehem's manger. And this was not just by chance, but it, it happened at, at, the, at the perfect time of when uh, God would uh, break into uh, human history and bring to this earth its uh, only hope, which is the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, on the contrary, they saw that the hand of God preparing the advent of Jesus in all events prior to the birth and in all the historical circumstances around it. The same could be said about the birth of the church, which resulted from the work of Jesus. God had prepared the way so that the disciples, after receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, would be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Therefore, uh, the church uh, was never disconnected from the world around it. The first Christians were first century Jews, and uh, it was uh, as such that they heard and received the message. Then the faith spread, first among other Jews and eventually among Gentiles, uh, both within and beyond the borders of the Roman Empire. And in, in order to understand the history of Christianity in its early centuries, we must begin by looking at the world in which it began and spread. 
there's three uh, uh, things uh, that we have to look at. That's uh, Judaism and Palestine. Yeah, in the last minute here, I want to give you the, the three things that we're going to consider in the next session. I hope you can join me. Uh, the world of which Christ and the apostles were in in the first three centuries was we have to look at Judaism in Palestine. Then we have to look at the diaspora of Judaism. After Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 BC, the kingdom split north from the south and the ten tribes of Israel, the north, scattered all over the world in diaspora. We got to look at that. And then we, we've got to look at the Greek, the Greco-Roman world of which the apostles begin to take uh, the, the good news of the gospel out to this, this world. So I hope you can join me in the next session when we can look closer at Judaism in Palestine, the diaspora of Judaism, and the Greco-Roman world. This is your friend Richard Allinger saying goodbye, friends. when you barbecue. Down underneath all the white ash, there's a little coal still burning. And from that coal, the fire can be built again. Flint is rising out of the ashes, and the coal is our farmer's market. Real food, real community. The Flint Farmer's Market, all winter long. See this frog? I add boiling water. No, wait, 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 wait. See that? He jumps out. Smart frog. Now this guy, he's just as smart, but he won't jump out. Could jump out, but he won't. Really? He'll just stay in the beaker as the temperature slowly rises, never noticing, until he boils alive. Why doesn't he just get out? I mean, if he can get out, he should just get out. Right? Hey Flint, did you know there's a medicine to treat a stroke if you get to the hospital as soon as the symptoms start? No? Then you're not alone. The people of Flint are joining together to become Stroke Ready. Stroke Ready will help us recognize the signs of stroke by thinking fast and to get to the hospital right away for stroke treatment. Just listen.
Stay For your future at Mott Community College. gentlemen I'm so uh, glad that you could uh, rejoin me in uh, looking at Christianity uh, and the ancient church the first 300 years of the church uh, and uh, this was this this was uh, the world into uh, which Christianity was born uh, the presence of Judaism in various uh, parts of the world uh, the order of the Roman Empire and Hellenistic civilization provided avenues for the proclamation of the new faith. Uh, but they also provided obstacles and even danger. It, it is certain that some of the apostles Christ had chosen, particularly Peter, uh, John, and Paul, did travel proclaiming the gospel and supervising the churches that had been planted, either by them or by others. Perhaps uh, other apostles such as uh, Thomas the Doubter did likewise, but most of the traditions regarding apostolic travels date from a later period when it was believed that the apostles divided the world among themselves and each church planted in each country or city sought to claim apostolic origins. In truth, most missionary work was not carried out by the apostles, but rather by the countless and nameless Christians who for different reasons um, uh, in persecution, business, or missionary calling traveled from place to place taking the news of the gospel with them. The Bible is silent as to what happened to Christ's 12 chosen apostles, with the exception of James, the brother of John, who it is written in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, was executed with a sword by King Herod. Therefore, whatever uh, had been written and recorded as what happened to other chosen 11 apostles would be speculation. It is imperative for me to cite the statistical fact at this point of my presentation that the number of Christians from the first century of Christ's church remained the same or constant through each subsequent century of the church age up to the 16th century of Dr. Martin Luther's time. I know that you have, I, I know that you have, I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. 
The first conflicts with the state. From its very beginning, uh, Christianity uh, was no easy matter. The, the, the Lord whom uh, Christians served uh, has died on the cross, condemned as a criminal. Soon thereafter, Stephen was stoned to death following uh, his indicting witness before the council of the Jews. Then James was killed at Herod Agrippa's order. Ever since then, and up to our own days, there have been those who have had to seal their witness with their blood. Those will actually win a martyr's crown. Uh, that will be their reward. Uh, the early Christians did not believe that they were following a new religion, uh, uh, this new Jewish sect of Nazarenes. Uh, the early Christians did not believe that they were following a new religion. Uh, they were Jews, and their main difference with the rest of Judaism was that they were convinced that the Messiah had come. Uh, whereas other Jews continued awaiting his advent. Therefore, the uh, Christian message to Jews was not that they should abandon their Jewishness. On the contrary, now that the Messianic age has begun, they were to be better Jews. Likewise, their early proclamation to the Gentiles was not an invitation to accept a newly born religion, but rather become participants in the promises made to Abraham and his descendants. Gentiles were invited to become uh, children of Abraham by faith, since they could not be so by the flesh. This invitation was made possible because since the time of the prophets, Judaism had held that through the advent of the Messiah, all nations would be brought to Zion. For those early Christians, Judaism was not a revival, was not, uh, excuse me, for those early Christians, Judaism was not a rival religion to Christianity, but the same faith, even though those who followed it did not see or believe that the prophecies had been fulfilled. The history of Jewish-Christian relations in the first year of Christianity has had fateful consequences. While Christianity appeared as a, a historical sect within Judaism, the latter tried to suppress it, as can be seen in various books of the New Testament. Books, uh, it should be added, written by Christian Jews. Since that time, however, Jews have not been in a position where it was possible for them to persecute Christians. In fact, the opposite has often been the case. When Christianity became the official religion of the majority, there, there were those who, on the basis of what the New Testament says about the opposition of Judaism to Christianity, and without any regard for the di different historical circumstances, declared the Jews to be uh, a rejected race, persecuted them, and even massacred them. Such an uh, attitude uh, would have been abhorrent to Paul, who claimed that he was being persecuted for the hope of Israel. And then uh, looking at the persecution under Nero, thanks to his mother's uh, intrigues, Nero reached the Roman throne in October of 54 AD. Uh, there are words from Tactius, uh, are of great value, for they are of the most ancient extent indications of how pagans viewed Christians. Tacitus did not believe that the, f the fire in Rome was set by Christians. Furthermore, he did not approve of Nero's uh, refined cruelty. But all the same, this good and cultured Roman believed a great deal of what was being said about the abominations of Christians and their hatred of humankind. Tacitus and other authors writing contemporaneously do not detail these supposed abominations. Second century uh, authors would be more explicit, but in any case Tacitus believed the rumors and thought Christians hated humankind. Uh, this 
last change makes sense if one remembers that all social activities, uh, the theater, the army, classical literature, sports, were so entwined with pagan worship that Christians often felt the need to abstain from them. Therefore, to the eyes of the Roman, uh, such as the Tacitus, who loved his culture and society, Christians appeared as haters of humankind. Tacitus wrote uh, that before killing the Christians, Nero used them to amuse the people. Some were dressed in furs to be killed by dogs. Others were crucified. Still others were set on fire early in the night so that they might illuminate it. Nero opened his uh, own gardens for then uh, shows and in the circus he himself became a spectacle for he mingled with the people dressed as a charioteer or he rode around in his chariot. The Christians were not being destroyed for the common good but rather to satisfy the uh, cruelty of one person. Once again, the pagan historian uh, Tacitus, uh, while showing no love for Christ, uh, Christians, indicates that the reason for uh, this persecution was not justice but the whim of the emperor. It is difficult to know the extent of the Ner Neronian persecution. Christian writers from the latter part of the first century and the early, early in the second recall the horrors of those days. It is also very likely that both Peter and Paul were among the uh, Neronian martyrs. Although at first uh, Christians were charged with arson, soon they were persecuted for merely uh, being Christian and for all the supposed abominations connected with that name. Ancient writers tell us that Nero issued an edict against Christians, but such an edict, if it existed, is no longer extant. In 68 AD, Nero was deposed by a rebellion that gained the support of the Roman Senate and killed himself. The persecution ceased, although nothing was done to rescind whatever laws Nero had passed against Christians. A period of such political turmoil followed that the year 69 AD is known as the year of uh, four emperors. Eventually, uh, Vespasian uh, gained control of the government and during his reign and that of his son Titus, Christians were generally uh, ignored by the authorities. And then the next persecution was under Domitian. Domitian, who became an emperor after Titus, uh, at first paid no particular attention to Christians. Why he eventually turned against them is not clear. It is a fact that he loved and respected Roman traditions and that he sought to restore them. Christians in their rejection of Roman gods and many Roman traditions stood in the way of Domitian's dream and this may have been one of the causes of persecution. Jews also found themselves in trouble with the emperor. Since the temple had been destroyed in 70 AD, Domitian decided that all Jews should be uh, remit to uh, imperial coffers uh, and the annual offering they would uh, gather every year at Yom Kippur that they would otherwise have sent to Jerusalem. Some Jews refused to obey while others sent the money but made clear that Rome had not taken the place of Jerusalem, in response Domitian enacted strict law against Judaism and insisted on the offering in an even harsher terms. Domitian's uh, persecutors were directed against both Jews and Christians. Uh, in Asia Minor, uh, the persecution resulted in the writing of the book of Revelation whose author was exiled on the island of Pathmos. There are indications that many were killed, and for uh, generations the church in Asia Minor remembered the reign of Domitian as a time of trial. In the midst of persecution, uh, Revelation displays a much more negative attitude toward Rome than the rest of the New Testament. Paul had instructed Christians in Rome to obey the authorities, 
whom he declared to have been ordained by God. But now the seer on Pathmo drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 and verse 6. Uh, furthermore, the hope of a new heavenly city found in Revelation is the counterpart of the present earthly city over against the city of Rome, Babylon the Great, or the Great Harlot. Christians should look uh, to the new Jerusalem coming from heaven where God will wipe all tears from their eyes. Fortunately, when persecution broke out, Domitian's reign was coming to an end. Like Nero, Domitian was increasingly seen as a tyrant. His enemies conspired against him, and he was murdered in his own palace. Since history has long seen Domitian as a madman lusting for power, and recognition as a divine being, Christian historians have also been convinced that anyone who persecuted Christians must have been a tyrant or a madman. The Christians after Domitian's fall have had a few years of peace. No, no one thereafter have taken notice of them. And then the persecution of the second century. Now I begin uh, to now I begin to be a disciple. Let fire and cross flocks of beasts, broken bones, dismemberment come upon me so long as I attain to Jesus Christ, Ignatius of Antioch. Although the Roman Emperor or although the Roman Empire began persecuting Christians from the time of Nero throughout the first century, the details of such persecution are scarce. By the second century, however, record, record began to afford uh, a clear view of the issues involved in the persecutions of and the attitudes of Christians toward martyrdom. Of these, the most dramatic are the acts of the martyrs, which retell the arrest, trial, and execution of, uh, of, of the martyrs. Secondly, uh, the most valuable is probably the set of seven letters that the aged Bishop Ignatius of Antioch wrote on his way to martyrdom. Finally, the second century offers further glimpses into the attitude of Roman authorities across the new faith. In this context, the correspondence between Publius and Trajan is most illuminating. Uh, the correspondence between Publius and Trajan. The, the question arose, should Christians be punished for concrete crimes or should they should should the very name Christian be considered a crime not knowing what course to follow Publius suspended proceedings in, in this regard and wrote to Emperor Emperor uh, Trajan for further instruction the Emperor's response was brief when it comes to the punishment of Christians, there is no general rule that is equally valid in all circumstances. When referring to the imperial church, Justo Gonzalez cites the words of Constantine, the eternal, holy, unfathomable goodness of God does not allow us to wander in darkness, but shows us the way of salvation. This I have seen in others as well as my, in myself. Constantine's religious policies, policies had such an enormous effect on the course of Christianity that all of part two, titled The Imperial Church, may be seen in Justo Gonzalez's work as a series of reactions and adjustments in response to those policies. Thus, Constantine would leave his mark on Christian church for more than a thousand years. Justo Gonzalez presents the first thousand years of Christianity in four parts. Number one, the ancient church. Number two, the imperial church. Number three, the medieval church, or the church of the Middle Ages. And number four, the beginnings of colonial Christianity. Uh, providing us with a good general history of Christianity, with an excellent look backward, back to the image of God revealed in the story of Jesus, Jesus Christians have always considered the age of Jesus and his apostles a kind of model for all other ages. It gave to the church faith in Jesus, 
the resurrected Messiah, and the hope of forgiveness of sins through him. Uh, the, the message of the Bible is, since Christ came, is no matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you. Uh, and he wants, he wants to be accepted of you. Uh, and he wants you to uh, a- pray and ask him to uh, let him come into your heart. He stands at the door and knocks. Uh, and we should open up our hearts door to him. A wonderful, great Savior Jesus is. And we hope that uh, all men and women and boys and girls can come to know him in a personal uh, salvation relationship. Uh, and the age of demonst- the age and the age of demonstrated uh, in the life of Paul uh, that the gospel of grace recognizes no boundaries of nation, race, sex, or culture. The Catholic Christianity that accepted this truth spread rapidly throughout the Mediterranean world. It confronted the following alien ideas having their roots embedded in heresy. Gonzalez cited several heresies that moved early Orthodox Church Fathers to expose their error in defending the truth that Christ taught. Uh, One of the heresies was called Gnosticism. It embraced a special knowledge that had unscriptural assessments of man who was created in the image of Elohim, uh, the Hebrew word for uh, Almighty God, Creator, and who Yeshua, Jesus, Savior, has the Father's incarnated Son, John 3.16. And the second heresy was cited by Jesso Gonzalez was uh, Marcionism. Uh, Marcion profoundly disliked both Judaism and the material world. He thus developed an understanding of Christianity that was both anti-Jewish and anti-material. The Orthodox Church came to the uh, conclusion that this doctrine contradicted fundamental points of the Christian doctrine. And uh, then the other heresy that Gonzalez cited was uh, Mont- Montan- Montanism, Montna- Montanism, Montanism. Their leader was Montanus, and uh, he was a prophetic. Uh, 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 the, this man was uh, like a prophet in the second century, uh, and he was like a prophetic movement originating in 170 A.D. in Phaigra, where a Christian name. Montanus began to utter prophecies in a state of convulsive frenzy. He and his supporters claim that his ecstatic condition was a sign that he was totally possessed by the Holy Spirit, who was integrating a new dispensation of divine revelation. They demanded unhesitating recognition for a new prophecy. Others demurred at this because uh, the ecstatic mode of prophecy was contrary, they said, to recognize church tradition. Some believing Montanus uh, to be uh, demon-possessed uh, even tried to have him exercise, but they were frustrated by his supporters. Several local church councils did condemn Montanus' uh, prophecies. Uh, but were powerless to prevent the Montanus movement running its course and creating a split within the churches. Circulation of Montanus prophecies and oracles were greatly widespread to the point of gaining its most outstanding convert, uh, the African writer Tertullian. The church, uh, by Tertullian's time, had reached such maturity that it could tolerate standards previously beyond its capacity. But opponents to Montanism con- contended that they, these developments were innovations contrary to Scripture. The influence of Montanism uh, on the church lasted about a generation at first. It uh, provoked an uh, inconclusive debate on the validity of ecstatic prophecy. But attention later turned to the more important issues of whether the church was to expect further revelation after the apostolic era, uh, and that's called cessationism versus continuationism. Uh, Montan- Montanism failed in the uh, end to convince the church that it was a valid addition to recognize scripture. The mainstream church was left with a heightened appreciation of the apostolic teaching and prophecy in all forms virtually disappeared from the church. 
And then the next uh, heresy that arose in the early years of the church was uh, Manichaeism. Once regarded as a Christianized form of Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism is now generally accepted as one of the last and most complete manifestations of Gnosticism. It was founded by a Syro-Persian Syro Mani in 216, and he lived to 276 AD, uh, who was uh, brought up in a Jewish Christian sect in South Babylonia and subsequently rebelled against it. The Manichaean Gnosis embodies a complex cosmic drama which centers on primordial battle between the originating principle of light and darkness. These uh, Gnosis teachers uh, that the soul is in a body which is utterly evil and corrupt. The soul could, however, be awakened by knowledge or Gnosis uh, and be made aware of its divine origin. Jesus in Manichaeism is one of the, a series of Gnostic saviors, and his historical manifestation was purely uh, docetic or Jesus the teacher. Uh, the individual details uh, were deferred mainly from Jewish and Christian apocrypha uh, and from the cosmogonic uh, teaching of the Edessan philosopher uh, Barzigan in 154 to 222 AD. Manny was also heavily influenced by Marcion from whom he uh, acquired a strong uh, uh, Pauline uh, antinomianism and claimed the title of the Apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, Manichaeism was particularly well established in Roman Africa where it is passed itself off as a more perfect form of Christianity, including the young uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, among those who were captivated by its higher criticism of the Jewish and Christian scripture. In the last minute, I'm going to tie up this one, this one heresy of Manichaeism and then hope you join me in future sessions for the rest of these heresies that popped up in the first uh, 300 years of the church. Uh, the dualism of Manichaeism was later seen by the church authorities in the Middle Ages as having been inherited by heretical movements such as uh, the uh, Pezzarines and the uh, uh, Cathars in the East. The uh, religion gradually expanded along the Silk Road and eventually reached China where it was outlawed. After the 9th century, however, the religion became strongly established in Central Asia. Later, the sect went underground in China and survived as a secret religion in the south until the 16th century. The Manichaeism uh, canon consists of two corpus and seven works by Mani, none of which has survived in complete form. The Cologne Mani Codex was, has been successfully restored and edited. It shows beyond doubt that the sect had its origins in the fringe of Judeo-Christianity and not in Iranian religions. And with that, uh, this is your teacher, Richard Allinger, uh, wishing you all to have a uh, um, uh, good new year and I hope you can join me in my next session where we're going to be looking at some of the her heresies that popped up that were unscriptural that some of the uh, church fathers had to uh, have councils to actually refute. Uh, this is your friend Richard Dallinger saying goodbye friends.